What is going on guys? In this video, we're going to be talking about the strategy pattern in the context of software design. And we're going to be talking about it by looking at it through the lens of this book, which is Head First Design Patterns. This is a book that references the design patterns that were kind of coined by the gang of four. And I'll put a link to that book up in the top here if you're interested. But this book is a different way of teaching that same material. In the original book, it's very, very tough to get through, very theoretical in nature and this is a lot easier to read, much more realistic examples and applicable to everyday life. So in this series, we're going to be talking about all the design patterns that are in this book. We're going to be going through them one by one. And in this video, we're going to start with the first one, which is the strategy pattern. And the strategy pattern is a very, very useful pattern, not only in software development, but also in system architecture as well. Uh, we're not going to get into the system architecture components in this video, but just know that it's applicable to more than just software. Uh, so just keep that in the back of your mind. But firstly, let's define the strategy pattern from this book. So the definition from this book is as follows. The strategy pattern defines a family of algorithms, a family of algorithms, and encapsulates each one and makes them interchangeable. So what does that mean? So it defines a family of algorithms. So it says there's a grouping of algorithms that all kind of may do the same kind of thing or the same theme, encapsulates each one. So if you're using OOP or object-oriented programming, that would mean that it wraps a class around this functionality and makes them interchangeable. So it likely uses an interface here so that you can swap out these behaviors at any point in time. So going further, the strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from clients that use it. And I'll repeat that last part one more time because it's very important. The strategy lets the algorithm vary independently from the clients that use it. And this is really the essence of the strategy pattern. It lets you encapsulate or group a behavior into a class in the OOP sense and then make that class interchangeable with other classes. So if there's a host class that's using it, the host class can use those low level encapsulations of behaviors without necessarily having to know how they are implemented or how they work. This is really where strategy pattern comes in. And in fact, you've probably already used strategy pattern without even knowing it. If you're a developer, maybe an experienced developer, uh, there's different degrees. And in the example that I'm about to give you now, this is gonna be a classic and relatable implementation of the strategy pattern. Like I said, there's other forms for it, but this is kind of the de facto example of how the strategy pattern works. And so what we're going to do now is walk through an example of the strategy pattern as it applies to a real life scenario in this book. So in this book, they're talking about uh, ducks and ducks have different behaviors that are associated with them. So all ducks can swim, right? So all ducks would have a swim function when it's invoked, it would kind of enable the swim behavior. And then as well, maybe all ducks also have a display function that just prints out the characteristics of this duck. Now, what would happen if we wanted to add a flying function? So fly, okay? Now, not all ducks fly, right? So only a certain subset of ducks fly. In this example, I think they say a mallard duck is one that flies. And there's other ducks that don't fly. Right. So how do we accomplish this? Well, you can always just like add a fly function in here. And then in the subclasses, you override this with something that has no behavior, or maybe like does something silly, like throws an exception like that. But this is not a good way of doing this. This isn't the OOP way. So what is the correct way of doing this? So let's scroll down a little bit and take a look at some of the other class diagrams that we're going to build out here. So say we have in this example, two other types of ducks. Like I said, there's the mallard duck, mallard duck. And then there's also the red duck. These are two different types of ducks as per this book. And I'm just modifying the example slightly in this book, but I'm just kind of giving you the, the gist of what you need to know. And let's say um, this duck here has different behavior. So a mallard duck is able to fly. So it also has a swim function that it can override or inherit from the parent class. And it also wants to have a fly function. Let's get that green out down over here. 
right? So it wants to have that fly function. Whereas the red duck, it doesn't know how to fly, right? So it only knows how to swim. It does not know how to fly. So how can we implement this fly function in an OOP way, but maybe by using an interface or something that allows this to be a little bit more extensible? And let me just kind of draw out the lines here just to explain the relationship. So in this example, we are saying these red lines kind of, um, this would be a superclass, the duck is the superclass, and these would be the subclasses, the mallard duck and the red duck. So now we want to add fly functionality, so how do we actually do it? Now let's take a different color here. So one option is to use interfaces and maybe do something like you have a flyable interface, flyable interface. And then the flyable interface would have a fly function, and then the mallard duck would implement the fly function, right? Implement fly. Let's get the green back over here. So this can certainly work, and this is a pretty natural reaction. I think this is the way that most people would probably do this in real life. So it makes sense from the OOP lens. But the problem with this implementation is that what if we have like a different subclass here? So, you know, a, a different, um, not mallard duck, but maybe, I don't know, gray duck. I'm just making something up now. So gray duck. And this gray duck also needs to fly. And we want the fly function to do the same thing that exists in the mallard duck. So that means the gray duck would also need to implement the fly function as well. So that's not very reusable, right? Ideally, we only want to implement the fly function once and then have that shared between all the classes. And this is where the strategy pattern can make this a little bit easier. So just to recap, we have a duck superclass here and we want to implement the fly function for some of its subclasses. And we saw that a natural way to do this is to have a interface called flyable and a fly function. And then for the classes that want to implement fly or they want to be able to fly, they just implement the flyable, excuse me, so this should probably be, uh, let me just cross that out. So implement flyable, little correction there. Uh, and then and then these classes independently would in implement the fly function. And we see that the problem is that now uh, any other class that wants to have this same fly function needs to redefine the fly function that's used in the other classes. So not a very reusable approach. So how does this get simplified using the strategy pattern? Okay guys, so I just changed the layout a little bit here just to give myself a little bit more real estate, so don't be alarmed. Uh, so how are we gonna implement this using the strategy pattern? And the key is not to bind it to any functionality that is defined at compile time, to make it so that we can take that behavior, encapsulate it, put it into a class, put it into a ball, put it into something that we can reuse so that we can pass it around later and let that information be passed into our host class and used by our host class. So how we're gonna do that is by using a interface. And so let me get my red color here. So we're gonna create a interface called, uh, actually let me just denote that this is gonna be an interface. So interface in red, and this thing is gonna be called fly behavior, fly behavior. So again, instead of tying the implementation of fly behavior into the mallard duck, into the red duck, into any, any other duck that wants to fly, we're gonna pull that out and put that into an interface. And that's gonna be called the fly behavior interface. And then this fly behavior interface is gonna have a concrete implementation. Let me actually get some yellow here. So that's gonna have a concrete implementation and they can, this can have as many implementations as you want. So in this case, we're talking about ducks and ducks mostly fly with wings last time I checked. So we can have a implementation of the fly behavior interface being called the fly with, with wings implementation. And this fly with wings class, uh, obviously it needs to implement something and say this fly behavior interface uh, specified a function, an avoid, inter avoid function called fly and that must be implemented by the fly with wings class here. Let me just put a line in between to, to separate them. And so now this fly with wings class can define fly in any which way it wants and then create an instance of this fly with wings class and pass that in to many different ducks. So now all of a sudden, instead of having to recycle that fly function and write it in every, every one like we saw previously or any other duck that wants to implement this behavior, we can just create this single instance, pass it to the duck and let it be used by any of the other, I call them host classes. So how does this picture over here on the left need to change? Well, we need to add a couple different things. So we need to add a instance level variable of type fly behavior. So fly 
behavior. And I'm probably going to run out of room, so I'm just going to say FB for short. And then we need to add a mechanism to invoke the fly behavior fly function like we have over here. So we can do this in multiple ways, but the way the book suggests is by creating a perform perform fly function. And this perform fly function would call on the fb.fly method. And now you can change the constructor of the duck class to take in a fly behavior and pass that in as runtime. You can even create a setter so that you can change this functionality later. That way, if you have many different types of implementing classes of the fly behavior interface, these can all be swapped out at runtime. So now the mallard duck, when it's instantiated, it can just easily call the perform fly function and it's gonna fly. Uh, meanwhile, the red duck, if we have a different implementing class, maybe something called, make it a different color here. So maybe something called um, like no fly, maybe this type of duck does not fly, this is just kind of a no-op class, then the red duck can use the no-fly class because it doesn't know how to fly. But you can see the benefit here. We can create a single instance now of this and just pass it along. So now I'm gonna show you how to actually set this up using a real coding example. And we're gonna do that using the Java language. So I'm gonna bring you over into my IDE right now. Okay guys, so here we are in my IDE. Uh, so we have a duck class here. We can see this is an abstract class. We have an instance level variable called fly behavior of type fly behavior. Uh, we have a constructor that takes in that fly behavior and sets that variable. And then we have a perform fly function that simply invokes the behaviors fly function. Uh, so let's take a look at the fly behavior now. So we see that the interface just has a simple fly function. We see the concrete class fly with wings implements the fly behavior interface. And then we are overriding that fly behavior interface by actually implementing it and saying, I'm flying. So it's just printing it out. And then we have a mallard duck now, which is just a implementation of that abstract duck class, uh, uses the super to just call the base constructor. And again, just performs fly by calling the fly behaviors fly function. So now if we take a look at the runner of this class, which is the main function, what does this actually look like? So all we have to do is instantiate an instance of the behavior now, so new fly with wings, and we're denoting it through the interface here, and then create a new instance of mallard duck by calling new mallard duck and passing in this fly with wings. And then we're just calling that perform fly function. And the neat part about this here is that we only need to define fly with wings once. And the big idea, the big take home here is to remember that these behaviors can be interchanged with any implementing classes of type fly behavior. So you can swap out the behaviors of these ducks in this example at runtime if you're using like a setter function that's exposed to your clients. This is why the strategy pattern is so awesome. It encapsulates behavior in a concrete class and lets you pass it around and reuse it. So that is the strategy pattern. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps to promote the channel. And stay tuned to this series because I'm gonna be doing videos on every single one of the design patterns that are in this book. And if you're interested in this book, Head First Design Patterns, I'll put a link down below in the description section so you can check it out. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.